Where is my super suit? Wow. <gasps> Gretchen Wieners. Mm, 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 mm. Shout out to you for this very subject. It was very interesting and fun to learn about. So I hope that everyone else feels the same about it. Did you ever find that, that documentary that's about your friend? Because that is litty. That is really cool. That sounds good. Oh my um my own wife watching ads on my Twitch stream. <laughs> oh man. What's it called? I hope it's not called like Fish Boy or something like that. That would be wooed. Oh, yeah. This is happening. <laughs> Whoa! Resub! Hell yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now I can't sing that song without thinking ch 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 chumba. Just travesty. Oh man, you don't remember what it was called. Hmm. Wait, let me do a quick. Because I might have sensed something about. Also, do you remember if they specifically had lamellar ichthyosis? That would be. Okay, there's the skin we wear. That's one. Born different. It's probably not that one. TLC to feature San Jose man with rare disease. Who knows? Is a bussy an epidermis? Yes. Yeah. It's got lots of Merkel cells, probably, which are touch receptors. <laughs> it's got mucosa membranes. It do. It do got those muco mu mucosa membranes. It's got a couple glands in there. For mucoxa. Mm -hmm. Got a couple of dick sensing glands, I think. Okay. Well, Kenzie, there's a lot of a, a lot of James Griffins who seem to have had documentaries oh, yeah! made about the It's happening. It's happening. We're all resubbing. We're all owners of mucous membranes. And because we're subs, we fill them up. <laughs> okay. Is that what we do? That is, it is what we do. Is you know what? what you do? know what? You know what? I will right now. I'm going to start talking about science before I, <laughs> before I regret it, before I say anything, anything worse. Um, okay, so, at the suggestion of good old Gretchen Wieners, I'll be talking about uh, a special friend, a special enzyme called transglutaminase 1. It's a mouthful. Uh, it's an enzyme that helps our skin be like this. Ooh, smooth, mechanically resistant, strong, protective. Much of that is thanks to this enzyme. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today, in addition to the enzyme itself, you know, of course, I have those little secret, secret learning subjects that I like to pop in there. We'll talk about the skin. We'll talk about the epidermis specifically. We'll talk about some of the cells uh, of the epidermis. We'll talk about certain pathologies that arise if you have issues with this enzyme and some other genes. So it's going to be a beautiful and grand old time. 
So the epidermis, that is the very outer layer. You're, you're looking at your epidermis right now. Um, so that's where, that's where all the action is going to be at. Uh, this right here, this is the epidermis. So the, the, the light pink part is the dermis. So that's going to be below the epidermis. Um, and then we're going to have a few layers within the epidermis that we're going to talk about. We're going to see what cells live there. We're going to, um, see what makes our skin such an effective barrier. Um, what makes it so effective at you know, keeping us safe from the outside world. Um, so specifically what it protects us from is going to be UV radiation. Uh, there are special cells in the epidermis that create melanin. I'm sure we're familiar with that. And melanin is going to protect our skin from DNA damage. Oh my gosh! Almost never sober! Thanks for the follow. And also, hell yeah. <laughs> um, what else does the epidermis do? It protects icky things from getting in. It prevents any unwanted chemicals from getting into our body. It prevents pathogens from entering the body. Not just physically, not just because it's a physical barrier to the outside world, but because we have immune cells that are specific to the skin. Um, and lastly, of course, it provides physical resistance to injury. Um, uh, another important function of the epidermis is that it keeps us hydrated with these special lipid layers. Uh, so it prevents water that we want from leaving our body. Um, and yeah, we love the epidermis. It, it's so, it's so important. And, you know, we just, we don't thank it enough. Dope content. Thank you. Thank you. I try to, uh, you know what? I'm gonna, I am I gave her a shout out earlier, but I'll say it again. Uh, Gretchen Wieners is the one who suggested I talk about this. Um, and then Gray and White is uh, another individual who has suggested previous fascinating topics. So uh, a lot of thanks. To, uh, the reason what I've talked about is so fascinating is because people give me really, really good recommendations. <laughs> um, why am I naked underneath my skin? <laughs> well, you know, that's just who you are as a person, Gray. You know, you're indecent. You're indecent. Put your skin back on. <laughs> okay, so these are the main functions of the epidermis. But why is it like that? And what lies within and beneath its 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 beefy layers? Well. It's got four of those. It's got four of those beefy layers. Um, we have the stratum basale, the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum, and the stratum corneum. Am I pronouncing those wrong? Or am I pronouncing them right? I'm pronouncing them right because remember, in molecular biology, you can pronounce things literally any way you want. <laughs> All right, so super easy. We'll just go through these um, four layers, and you're going to see how fascinating their microenvironments are. Of course, you know, it's the sandwich method, you know? I got I to gotta balance out my complimentary callouts with my shame callouts. <laughs> keeps, th keeps things spicy. Um... Okay, so we owe the reason why our skin is so good at being skin uh, to the cells of it, of course. Structure and function, structure and function. We love, oh my God, molecular biologists, we are obsessed with structure and function. The reason why the skin, the epidermis does what it does is because of the super special cells that compose it. Um, so those cells are what's going to help protect us from radiation. Um, those cells are going to produce antimicrobial chemicals that are going to help fight off invaders, basically. Um, so let's look at the very 
bottom layer um, first. We'll, we'll go bottom up. Ah, that's a great question. That's because the sun, we have the skin and it protects us from UV radiation, uh, or, or our skin protects us from UV radiation, and that's great, but it needs help. You know, like our skin, it can wear out really, really easily, especially if you have fair skin. The fairer the skin you have, the more prone you are to damage from UV radiation, and that is because of the lesser amount of melanin that you have. If you have darker skin, your skin produces more of that melanin. Um, and melanin, it, it comes to, it's, it's a pigment, and it comes to that top layer of your skin, and it literally just prevents DNA damage. So even though we have that mechanism physiologically, it, it needs help. Uh, actually, you can kind of see here. Uh, can you see my cursor? Yeah this top layer of our skin is constantly kind of being sloughed off. So even though most of this is providing protection, it's also dying constantly. <laughs> uh, yes, please, it's probably loud. Exactly, Gray, you are genetically superior. You got that melanin advantage. You got that uh, masterful DNA damage prevention. Does skincare do anything? It's a scam of the industry. Honestly, I kind of agree with you. Like, the in it really plays on our fears of like, oh no, getting old. Uh, but probably there's some truth to it. Like, um, I have acne scars right here. And when I put this, like, freaking lotion stuff on my face, it just, it makes them look a little better. But then the catch is I have to keep doing it because it totally comes back if I don't keep it up. <laughs> People tan their assholes. I, I can't say I've ever seen that. I've heard of asshole bleaching. People tan their assholes? That makes me think some thoughts. And it's a perfect segue into the bottom. <laughs> Get it? Because butts. The bottom layer of the epidermis. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So freckles, I think, are... I want to say it's a specific type of cell that is like either dying and it gets to the top of your skin or there's a weird abnormal or maybe not abnormal. I'm I'm not trying to be racist against freckle people, but like a certain release of contents from the cell as it gets closer to the surface of your skin. Um your butt is melanin challenge. <laughs> we got the bleachiest assholes ever up in here. <laughs> oh my god. All right, so the deepest, the deepest layer of the epidermis is <laughs> you are very abnormal, and that's why I love you so goddamn much. It's home to three really cool cells. Two of them are right here. We got the Merkel cell. That is a mechanoreceptor, meaning that it is sensitive to pressure. It is sensitive to touch. And it takes that mechanical information and transmits it into electrical information. How does it do that? It's a mystery, just like magnets. Um, but those electrical signals, because the cell is also connecting with afferent nerves, which go to your brain, um, it's giving you, it's giving your brain information about the outside environment. Like, ow, that is sharp. Or, ooh, this kitty is soft. <laughs> <laughs> we, no, we don't hate freckle people. <laughs> Slander. I have like one freckle, I think. Oh, Rebecca, did you hear the thing? This is skin related. Skin related. Did you hear the thing where like, as far as your senses of touch go? The human body, it does not know how to feel wet. Wetness is not a sense. What? So, like, you feel cold or hot, and yeah. you feel the weight on you, but you don't feel wet. I guess that kind of makes sense, because... Oh, like, there's no sense for wetness. Like, 
those are usually like mechanoreceptors like this, so it which is for like pressure and stuff like that. And then you have thermoreceptors, which are for heat or cold, but we don't have wet receptors. That is Amy indeed. I'm here. <laughs> I would maybe come on camera, but I'm a disaster right now. I don't mind if you want to show your not disastrous but beautiful face. Um, <laughs> if you want to do that, I I would not mind that. All I, right, I'm I, rolling them. She's not gross. She's lying. I have staples in my face. She does. Hi. Look at this. Move your hair. Mm. Hi. <laughs> She's here. She's beautiful. Hi. <laughs> I can feel when I'm, I'm wet. So, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm so swollen, like in my mouth right now. It's um, okay. You got hi. the you got the dong sucking lips. It's fine. Yeah. Oh, that's that's why we pay too much money. Yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, I'm on the fucking other computer and I'm like tippy tappy typing and I'm also interrupting everything. Every five She's seconds. my why producer, <laughs> not. Exactly. She she is beautiful. That is undeniable. Um All right. So we were talking about melanin earlier. Melanin is made by a cell called a melanocyte. Wow. We we like naming things in ways that make sense. We don't. This is a very rare example. Um but so the melanocytes are in this very very deep layer of the epidermis, but the melanin that they make travels up to the surface of the epidermis where it does its job of protecting our DNA from damage, uh, protecting it from radiation. Miss you too. You do. You do have those. They're deep within your skion. Uh, so yeah, those are the those are the two main cells that are in that deep layer, the stratum basale. But then there's a third secret one, my favorite one, the most important one, that we're going to talk about. Um, and it is something that will sort of go on a journey, as we're going to see, and change who it is as it moves through the different layers of our skin. So it is important for me to mention that the stratum basale has the lowest content of uh, calcium ions. The more color you have, the more of these cells one has. You know, I actually, I think it's not the cell, but rather how much melanin each cell is making. Um, that is a really good question. My My gut tells me that we all have a probably a very similar amount of these cell types, but that depending on your genetic makeup, they're going to be making more melanin. They're going to be more efficient at making that protein. Um, but I would have to check on that. I'd be keeping secrets. I'm going to reveal uh, secret number one right now. I love you all. That wasn't a secret. That was that was well known information. I lied. <laughs> Um, low calcium in the bottom layer, low calcium. Why is that important? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's because it's really, really vital to the development of our super secret special friend that I love so much, the keratinocyte. These guys are going to form that main barrier on the outer surface of the epidermis that is so important for its barrier function. Um, but they start in the bottom. They start at the very low level of the epidermis where they are proliferating. They're dividing. There's not a lot of differentiation going on because at this point they're kind of, they don't know who they are yet. They're undeclared, you know? They haven't chosen a major yet. Uh, and it's because of this low calcium environment. Low For keratinocytes, lower calcium favors proliferation rather than differentiation. But don't worry, we're not going to stay here for very long. We're going to go up to the stratum spinosum. Uh, the super interesting cell that hangs out here is called the Langerhans cell. 
this is an immune cell that um, has macrophage activity. So it'll go around and it'll eat anything that's trying to invade your body. It will also clear out any damaged cells. Um, and any of the pathogens that it eats, it will also present the antigen to the adaptive immune system. So this is a, a very important member of the epidermis. We also see a slight increase in calcium in this area, which is very important, of course, because who needs, who needs calcium? My friend, <laughs> the keratinocyte. <laughs> um, so the higher calcium is going to signal the keratinocyte to sort of shift from proliferating to more differentiating. And what I mean by that is the cell is going to start expressing different markers, different proteins that are going to push it toward having a new function as it moves through its differentiation journey. So we can see in this cell that's kind of different from the last one is these uh, black parts on the end, those are called desmosomes. So those are important because they are connections between cells. So keratinocytes that are starting to differentiate can sort of pass this information along to other cells in the layer. Um, and that's really important. That helps those cells move and you know differentiate. And then we also have, it's kind of hard to see, but these little lines right here, those are filaments. Those are special proteins that um, we mostly know them. They, they comprise the cytoskeleton of cells. Um, but in keratinocytes, there's a little bit more going on. Those filaments are going to do some very, very important things once they get to the surface of the epidermis. So. At this point, though, in the stratum spinosum, things are just starting out. All right. Now we're, we're almost at the top. We are at the highest amount of calcium that is in the epidermis. So this is going to really skyrocket keratino keratinocytes um, through their differentiation process. Um, we have a couple... A couple important things going on. The fil the filaments within the cell are um, we're we're getting more of them, um, and at this point, a keratinocyte it kind of evolves a little bit. We don't really we still call it a keratinocyte, but technically it's a granular cell because what starts to happen here is it starts forming things called lamellar bodies. Those are little vesicles within the cell that contain bunches of, of, of fatty acids, basically. Um, and the fatty acids and, and uh, let's see, cholesterol, um, those are going to be important, again, as we move to the surface of the skin, because we need those things to contribute to the skin's barrier function. Um, the, two, the thing to remember right now is that the reason the epidermis is such an effective barrier is because of proteins and lipids. So the lamellar bodies are going to be delivering lipids to the surface. All right. Um, so now we're super serious keratinocytes right now. We know what we want to be when we grow up. So after we leave the granular or the granulosum and we're almost at the top, we're between the granulosum and the corneum, we're in this transition zone. So as the as these cells approach the corneum, they're going to release those lamellar bodies. Um, and those fats and those proteins within those vesicles are going to help um, Specifically for, for, the, for that barrier function, they're going to help prevent water loss and they're going to help keep the skin moisturized, which is very important, of course. Um, so another argument for why uh, 
the skin skincare industry is bullshit. We have our own moisturizers that our body makes all on our own. So fuck those guys. <laughs> um we can also see that this huge black area right here. This is this is the nucleus right here. We have the filaments forming. We have these little um the lamellar bodies right here that are being released. This right here is called, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, keratohyalin. Keratohyalin. That is the protein that um, really helps recruit factors that maintain moisture within our skin. Uh, and as you can see, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It is displacing all of the organelles in the keratinocyte. And it's going to keep doing that until um, eventually there's no more organelles. When the keratinocyte is finally a part of the stratum corneum, it's no longer a keratinocyte anymore. We call it something else. It evolves. It's called a corneocyte. Um, so that keratohyalin that completely displaces it, it is now completely filling the cell. Um, and Again, it's really important for maintaining moisture, maintaining the pH of the area, um, and just helping with that protective function. So, corneocytes, you might have heard, heard this before, actually. Technically, those top, uh, that top layer of cells, the top layer of the epidermis, the, those corneocytes, they're technically dead. Um, I, I think that that's, uh, fairly accurate calling them technically dead because even after my research i don't know whether they're considered dead or alive everywhere just says they're technically dead um and that's a good thing we like that because um viruses cannot infect dead cells so that's a deterrent to um outside invaders right there the fact that the top layer of our skin contains cells that are technically dead means that that entire class of uh microorganisms or, or pathogens has to find another way in so we love that um the the stratum corneum is bunches of these cells bunches of corneocytes um and because that those filaments within the cell have completely displaced all of the organelles what they've also done is they've created um, this network of proteins and lipids called the cornified envelope. Um, so that is what makes these cells kind of special. They have this special membrane that is not present in any other cells of your body. And um, it's this really, really just very fascinating cross-linking of all these special proteins that all work together to protect you. Technically dead, just my, like my soul. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Time of death? When I was born. <laughs> um, so the... That layer is what... Structure and function. The structure of these corneocytes and the cross-linking of these proteins and their interaction with all the lipids in the stratum corneum is what gives the epidermis its function of protection and mechanical resistance. Um, and transglutaminase 1, TGM1, catalyzes the formation of that cornified envelope. It creates the cross-linking between the proteins. Uh, it, cre it, 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 creates, um, it creates that matrix. And it really, as, as we're going to see later when we talk about the associated pathologies, makes your skin, it helps make your skin this good, functional. Um, this is just a nice little visual of, of what I just talked about. Um, we have the layers right here. And then additionally, I really like this. 
K5, K14, K1, K10, those are different keratins. Keratin, of course, being a protein. And we know them uh, generally as proteins that make up our hair, skin, and nails. So as the keratinocytes are going through their differentiation journey, they're, they're expressing these different filaments, these different proteins, as they move through the layers of the epidermis. Um, that's uh, th These sorts of concepts are really central to, in molecular biology, receiving different signals, expressing different signals, um, having these specific combinations, like the early keratinocytes specifically express K5 and K14. Um, as we move up, though, this is when we start to see the actual transglutaminases. And you can see one is not the only one. It's the one that we're focusing on today, but we also have two other ones that are expressed here. Um, and then I don't care about cornifin, stupid. Remember involucrin, though. And remember fluorocrine. And maybe maybe I'll, I'll bring back filagrin, but... I'm pretty sure there's cornifin in my cereal. Yeah, you like to eat cornflakes. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> god, but yeah, these these proteins are going to come back to us. So, um, let's see how how TGM one gives our skin its function. So chemistry for a second. TGM1 creates isopeptide bonds between the proteins that are going to make this cornified envelope. Involucrin and loracrin are examples of those proteins. Um, specifically, it's going to make isopeptide bonds between glutamines and lysines. Those, those specific amino acids are <laughs> super easy to make isopeptide bonds with. So what we have here Protein, protein, it, it, it's being unspecific, but it could be <clears throat> involucrin or loracrin or any, uh, some of the ones that were listed in the previous slide. This is glutamine. This is lysine. We make them shake hands. Transglutaminase comes in and uh, catalyzes the, basically the, I, I can't say, Yes, we'll just say the formation of this bond where ammonia is being released. Because you can kind of see right here, we have the two amine groups, and now we just have the one. And so if we count, we just release ammonia in the process. I believe water is involved too. Um, water is what helps, uh, it probably, I don't know, picks up one of the extra hydrogens, I would imagine. And... Of course, this is important. This is, we we, we kind of saw this when we were looking at the different layers of the epidermis, but calcium is important. Calcium is a cofactor for TGM, meaning that TGM just needs calcium in order to carry out its catalytic function. Um, so it might not look like it, but the the formation of this bond is central to the formation of this cornified envelope, to the formation of this stratum corneum, that top layer of your skin. Um, it is not solely, but very heavily um, reliant on the cross-linking of proteins via this isopeptide bond. Um, and those are, uh, on the right there, that's, that's involucrin and loracrin, and I just need to point this out. These are horrendous models. These are terrible models. Like there's there's no good models of these proteins for some reason. And I'm assuming it's because we can't really find them alone. They're always cross-linked and you know wrapped up in these matrices. But anytime you see protein models that are really stringy like this, that means the program or the AI or the computer or whatever did this doesn't really know what that area looks like it doesn't know what's in that position so it's an approximation i just i use i use these models so much that i really wanted to point out that these are these are, especially this one this is all string this one has some alpha helices at least but this is terrible 
But anyway, those are the two proteins that are mainly going to be cross-linked together and form that barrier. Um, a good example, if this is kind of like, uh, I don't know, weird and existential to think about, like like many things. Uh, talk ooh, talk more about what the the models. Yeah, um, ooh, you know what? If 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 we don't mind that I do a little tangent, I can show you some some 3D modeling really quick just to show you why this is shit and other models are good. Um cuz it's like I think the program that I use is technically It's hard to tell what is and isn't AI, but or or what you or what we mean when we say AI, but, um, yeah, that's, that's super easy. I can pull it up really quick. I already have something. Um, so is this going to block it though? Okay. So you guys, you guys have seen me use these models before. Um, I go to a website that is called Swiss model. I type in the protein that I want and I pray that they have a human model that is that is good, that is quality. Um. <laughs> All right, good, 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 good. I'm glad. I'm gonna try and find an example of like a good looking one and like a shitty one. But um, if have you guys heard of DeepMind? Uh, that's like the Google AI or whatever. Apparently, and I haven't used it yet, but apparently DeepMind can model proteins for you. Um, it it's kind of cool. I mean, I think anything that does that kind of stuff is really cool to me. But also, it's taking from databases that already exist. So it's like whatever, bro. Like it's cool, but uh, and I I don't know the details on um how Swiss model. I I, I think actual I think it's not AI. I think actual scientists are experimenting and making these models, and that's what I'm pulling from right now. Um. But in any case, they're still using computers, they're using computer programs, and we we have programmed them such that they get, what's it called? Um, oh, the word will be right here. Confidence. Confidence scores. So um, the, the colors that you see on the involucrin and the loracrin, those are just... Uh, those are just colors based on what chain it is, but I can filter it by confidence. So let me do involucrin. That one's going to be hella funny because the confidence is going to be like nothing. So anytime I find something that's really, really low confidence, where so where it's, you know, the people who made the model or the AI that made the model are just not sure, you know, if that's the right amino acid, then we will be able to tell by the color. Aha, perfect. Okay, so let me just go confidence. And then, aha. Okay, so, and, and it looks like confidence scores are one to 100, 100 being like fairly confident that this is what the protein looks like. So let me just give y'all a little taste right here. Baba booey, baba booey. <laughs> yes. Okay. So this is involucrin. You the the same exact same model that I showed on the slide. Anything that's in, and and I filtered it by. I can do it by chain. There's not, not there's one chain, so it's one color, but I'm filtering it by confidence right now. Red is low confidence, meaning. We kind of think that this is the amino acid that goes there, and we kind of think that this is where it goes, but meh. And these stringies. So the, this right here, the confidence is 30. The stringies are also like 30 and 40. So the... <laughs> Blow your mind, but if <laughs> I'm doing it right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm already blowing you. Um, 
but then right here, oh, you guys can see my tabs. That's okay, actually. I don't, I don't, my pornography is is not is not there. But the blue is pretty confident. So let's go to a super like, what's what's a freaking protein that we know everything about? Um, hemoglobin. Who doesn't fucking know hemoglobin? Um, and this is all just gonna show me the subunits. Okay, human, 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 human. Hemo hemoglobin. Here we go. So this one, this looks a little better. We got a little more, uh, a little more blue, but then we also got some white, which is really, 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 really low. So this this does sort of outline how difficult it can be to model proteins. Um, just especially things like involucrin and loracrin that are always associated with something. We we can't, it's hard to look at them by themselves. Um, but this is probably really dumb, but really quick. Deep mind protein folding. This is good. This is going to be an AI. Okay. Also, my mind is blown. Alpha fold is what it's called. I know alpha fold. I didn't know that was DeepMind. I didn't know that was Google this whole time. <laughs> it's not it's not bad. It's just I didn't know that they were like helping me this whole time. Like helping with the stuff. All right, really quick before before we get back to the skin. Does it let me use it? Does it let me discover? Ah. Uh, well, in any case, you can see literally down here alpha fold model. Boom. If see how it's kind of not look anything like the other one that I just shown? Oh my god, look at that. It's all complex. This one isn't. That's because the alpha fold, the AI, is just going to show you what it knows. It's just going to show you its best estimate, even if that means cutting out a fuck ton of the other protein. Um, so, wow. Oh my god. Great. I honestly would not have known that if I didn't, like, try to <laughs> look at the Look at the AI deep mind protein folding. I think I totally would have gone this whole time just being like, yeah, alpha fold. That's not, that's just the one that I don't click on because it's not going to be accurate. Well, fascinating. Well, at some point, if you guys want to see more protein AI modeling stuff, I can definitely show you that. But for now, we must get back to the task at hand. Um, so this bond, super good, connects the proteins. You need that. That's what transglutaminase does. It makes this bond happen. It makes the proteins attach to each other. Um, another example that I'm going to give, just in case this one is kind of like, huh, what the fuck, is one that we, we all know. Yo, oh, guys, this is what the band, the band looks like. I wish I had a diet cock right now. I need to just have them. Or if not, the actual soda is just like, just like cans of this. What video? Video you use for Diet Cock. Oh, 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 it's the reverse. Yeah, <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, I'm good, thank you. I literally searched Diet Cock, and that was the one that came up with, and I was like, I'm going to dig that. Okay. So, factor 8A is it's it's also a transglutaminase but it does something pretty different it it doesn't have a function in the skin per se but it clots uh it, it instead of cross-linking involucrin and loracrin it cross-links fibrin which is what makes blood clots so if you have a problem with this gene it clauses clauses it clauses uh bleeding disorders like hemoph hemophilia, I don't know if it's this factor specifically, but hemophilia would be an example of like if you have a problem with um, uh, transglutaminase that crosslinks blood clots. Whew. Something you just gave me acid reflux. <clears throat> I think it was learning that alpha fold is deep mind. That's what did it. But yeah, that's it, the chemistry can be kind of blah, but just think about like it's linking proteins together much in the way that. It's kind of what's going on when we are making blood clots. 
So, it links those gosh darn proteins together. And it starts to arise, we start seeing transglutaminase 1 in the stratum spinosum. Because that's when we start seeing that rise in calcium. And TGM1 needs calcium. So, that's where it starts getting expressed. And that's what sort of, um, what's it called? As, as those keratinocytes are moving through their differentiation, TGM1 is there to start that cross-linking process. To start, you know prepping them to be barriers. Whew. So TGM by 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 crosslinking, by this this crosslinking ability that it has, this um creation of the isopeptide bonds, it does two really good things. It's helping to physically create that barrier, the cornified envelope which is what protects us against UV radiation pathogens and provides mechanical reinforcement. But then the other thing it does, instead of just cross-linking proteins, it also helps anchor lipids to the cornified envelope, to the proteins that make up that, uh, that barrier. And that helps to control permeability, basically. Permeability to certain um, liquids, ions, electrolytes, chemicals, things like that. Uh, and it, I think I believe its its main concern is um, keeping water in, helping us maintain um, healthy amounts of of good old H two O in our skin. So the combination of those functions of TGM one is what helps form that stratum corneum, that that last layer right here. Thank you, TGM one. Um. <clears throat> What if we what if we mess this up though? This is everyone's favorite question when it comes to molecular biology and its role in certain pathophysiologies. What if we fuck it up? Well, if you if you mess up TGM1, you could get a condition called ARCI, autosomal recessive congenital ichthyosis. Um, this is a, a family of diseases that is, cate that is um, categorized by um, skin uh, flaking and skin scaling that is present from birth. Um, wow. <laughs> dragon scales. <laughs> Literally. I mean, they're kind of like... It's kind of cool looking, but also it looks like it's really annoying. I, I don't know if it's not painful, apparently, but it looks like it could be really, really itchy. Um, these ARCIs, uh, in order to be categorized as such, they have to be present at birth. And there's going to there's definitely going to be germline mutations in certain genes that are going to cause this. Um, and they can go from. They're not being terribly severe or even resolving themselves uh, to like incredibly really bad. Um, so the main the main one that we're going to I'm going to go into some other forms and some and some other genes even. But uh, the main one is lamellar, lamellar ichthyosis. That is so hard to say. Lamellar ichthyosis. Um, because this particular subtype is caused by mutations in TGM1. So, specifically, oh my god. Okay, sorry about the words. It's okay. <laughs> um, so, it's going to present with something called a collodion baby, which you can see right here. Um, this baby is alive, and I feel the need to say that because of some of my past lectures. <laughs> this baby is living. It's fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> it's hard to see, but the what the collodion is, is it's this membrane that it is covering the baby and you can see the creases around uh, the baby's eyes and around its lip these have specific names there's the eclabian and the ectropian and that just means like areas in the membrane that are like um have covers over the eyes and the mouth um yeah so this is the combination of both the nickelodeon nickelodeon Who wants to fire Amy? No. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but all all babies born that have lamellar ichthyosis are born as a this is the literal t- term they just call them colloidian babies um and it what the, the condition is not it's not fatal really but it can cause there are certain complications associated with it um hypothermia and overheating can be issues because of course there are problems with um retaining water and uh there's also problems with uh I think the sweat gland the sweat glands are very um impaired in individuals with uh the with LI I'm going to say LI <laughs> um for that same reason that that water retention issue um there can be dehydration and uh they also tend to be pretty prone to skin infection because of the I guess damage that's being done to those layers of the skin that could impair the um um impair the function of the uh langerhans cells um but also oh super secret thing about keratinocytes that i forgot to mention they will release cytokines in response to pathogenic invasion and those cytokines are going to attract immune cells to come fight off invaders so issues with the tgm1 and not you know kind of leads to the impairment of keratinocyte differentiation so there's going to be less defense um in these individuals when it comes to um infections in the skin um so this th- this scaling that we see is a result of not just impaired keratinocyte development um from the beginning kind of but also impaired cross-linking of those proteins so the barrier itself is is cracked and has these imperfections because the enzyme isn't present to put those proteins together um and that means it's also not there to help anchor the lipids to the membrane which is why we see um the these issues with uh, water permeability um oh there's a third thing I wanted to say. Oh. So TGM1 impairment, like if there's a mutation that's messed up, obviously it's going to cause those things. But it's also, and this is something that um, I've mentioned in another, another lecture, if you have a protein that's made wrong and it's misfolded, it can build up in the cell and cause problems. So in keratinocytes that are supposed to be making this protein, if it's being made incorrectly, then their protein misfolding machinery is also being overwhelmed. Kind of like we saw in prions and neurodegenerative disease. <laughs> but, yeah. So, I'm going to take a second. I'm just going to show you some examples of specific uh, TGM1 mutations. And um, maybe kind of ju- just show you examples of types of mutations on a basic level. So... Most mutations in TGM1 are missense mutations. So what that means is that in the DNA, there's a nucleotide that changes, and because of that change, it switches. It it it, it causes a completely different uh, peptide, uh, uh, amino acid to be incorporated into the peptide. Um, if you saw my other, I, I think I've gone through like some of the amino acids and like that chart and everything. So this is not correct. I just don't know them off the top of my head. Let's say we have GAG, and that's like serine or whatever, GAG. Let's say that one nucleotide, so now we don't have GAG, we have GAU. And now it's a glycine. Like those are completely different amino acids. And the change resulted from one single freaking nucleotide change. Um, so an example of real actual TGM1 mutations would be R323W, which it sounds really dumb, but it's just an arginine at that 323 position is being switched to a tryptophan. Well, those are completely different freaking amino acids. That's going to cause some problems. And that actually takes place in the catalytic core, like the main part of the enzyme that does the reaction. It's crazy. And then we have another one. So an arginine being switched to a leucine, 
um, that mutation is associated with just the enzyme doesn't activate. Like it, it can't be, it can't do anything. It inactivates the enzyme. Um, and lastly, the S to Y, so that's serine to tyrosine, that affects, uh, serines get, get phosphorylated a lot. That's just their thing. And in this sense, I think phosphorylation is what helps anchor TGM to the membrane, which is what we want. It, it, it does its job anchored to the membrane. So if we have this mutation, <laughs> it's just free. It's just free falling. It's not anchored to the membrane. So it's not doing its function. Um, so those are examples of missense mutations in this gene that cause lamellar ichthyosis. Um, this other one that I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to say, don't be scared, okay? I don't know why it looks like this. This is so terrible. But you can kind of see it. It's fine. So we'll focus on the picture right now. Um, what this is representing is the coding part of the DNA. So exon 1, exon 2. An exon is a coding, a, a part of the DNA that actually codes for part of a protein. And what happens is they get spliced together. So the, the bullshit gets cut out. Oh my god. Scared the fuck out of me. <laughs> oh my god, what's my heart rate? Oh, it's still 80. I'm just, my heart is so healthy. I feel, wow. We have opened a chest and we have found the exons. All 15 of them. Uh, so you splice them together to make the actual mRNA that's for real, and then it gets translated into the protein. So that's what the green boxes are. Those are just the, the exons. And then the black lines in between are the splice sites. That's where they get cocoon. That's where they get chopped and then put together. Um, and then below it, it's really hard to read because, because of fuck, but it's just showing us which exon corresponds to which part of the final protein. So that really long pink part, we can see that it's the beginning of exon four, and then it goes to exon 12. So all of those ones in between are coding for that catalytic, uh, domain, which is the part that does the isopeptide bond. I don't know why I'm doing this. This is, this is enzyme to me. <laughs> um, so the single most common mutation that is found in, I want to say like almost all cases of lamellar ichthyosis is a splice site mutation. So what that means is the mutation is not in the coding part necessarily of the DNA but it's happening in a part that is supposed to be cut at a very specific place. When proteins are being made, the, the code for it, the mRNA, must be cut in the exact correct place so that the right exons will be spliced together. So this mutation happens in a splice site. Um, and what happens then is that it gets cut incorrectly. The code gets cut in the complete wrong place, um, which means it doesn't get spliced together correctly. Um, I believe this one specifically, it causes what's called a um, it, uh, premature stop codons. So not all of the code is going to be in, like incorporated into the final mRNA. And you have a weird sort of, order of the exons so when it goes to the ribosome to be translated into the protein it makes a messed up freaking protein that can't do its job um so this is i, I was this was found in like ugh, all cases of lamellar almost all cases of lamellar ich ichthyosis is this mutation it, that prevents the correct <laughs> the correct mrna from being made um, which is just, which is wild. I wish that this picture was really cool. I mean, I wish it didn't look so fricked up, but you know, that's fine. Um, so those are just muta mutations in TGM1. These cause lamellar ichthyosis subtype 1. That's right. There's more than one. Uh, 
So we can real quick. I'm gonna let's take a look at the uh, other mutations just for gigs and shits. Um, we have the ATP binding cassette twelve. Now this guy normally we need it in order to transport um, glucosal ceramides from within keratinocytes to the to outside of them to the stratum corneum, um, and of course that's important. Uh, ceramide is actually um, a very critical member of the stratum corneum, and it um, is needed for that um, prevention of water loss and water retention function. So if it's messed up, then there's this impaired transport of these lipids to the stratum corneum, uh, and that causes lamellar ichthyosis type 2. Next, we have SIP 4F22. <laughs> Um, this guy takes fatty acids and turns them into omega fatty acids. Um, and those omega fatty acids, again, they help, uh, contribute to that water barrier in the stratum corneum. So if there are mutations in this gene, that causes lamellar ichthyosis. Tres. Lastly, uh, this is ceramide synthase 3. It makes specific ceramides that are needed for uh, both water permeability and keratinocyte differentiation. So, of course, I mean, this is an easy one. No water permeability if you, if you don't have the ceramides. And um, you're going to have, I mean, the barrier itself is going to be significantly um, impaired if keratinocytes aren't differentiating. So that's going to cause lamellar ichthyosis. Um, so a lot, I mean, a lot of these have the, there's the different genes are involved, but, um, if our body is, loses this ability to regulate the, um, permeability of water in our skin, or, uh, it loses the ability to sort of, for these proteins to kind of make friends with each other, then that's going to lead to lamellar ichthyosis. Um, there are, I, I, I didn't include a slide for this and I should have, but there's an incredibly severe form of ichthyosis called Harlequin ichthyosis. Um, this one used to have, uh, a mortality rate actually the, in the, I think now the, the outlook is a little better. The prognosis is a little better for babies that are born with Harlequin ichthyosis. But it wasn't always like that. Like it, this one is just, I think it's a mutation in the ABCA12, but it's just a really, really severe form of um, ichthyosis. I'll show you guys some photos. I, I don't know why I didn't uh, include them in my slideshow, but I should have. But it's very, uh, it's very interesting. It looks, it, it looks and is a lot more severe than the ones that I showed you. And I forget, oh yeah, all the images on Google are like spoilered because it's just, it's so much more severe. But I want to make sure I get right why it is um more deadly. Oh, okay. It's the, it's just like the more severe heat loss um, and like, not really being able to regulate their temperature. Oh my god. And the skin is actually really hard, so it prevents them from, like, taking breaths well. Wow. Oh my god. Yeah, so there's, um... There's treatment now for, for newborns that are... that have harlequin ichthyosis, but it... It was a while. Like, it is a lot more. Mm. I th and I think these are very upsetting images, but I think these children are alive. Because this is... And they tend to be premature, but I think...
Okay, this one, this one is definitely, this one is, all right. Yeah, fair warning, it's a little upsetting, but this is j just so we can see the, it's a little more extreme than the, than the, just the lamellar ichthyosis, so. The skin uh, is a lot harder um, oh than the lamellar, yeah. This and this guy, this guy, the prognosis. I, I this, this baby lived. I'm gonna say right now. I know it's very upsetting looking, but this little guy was okay. I'm pretty sure. Um, and I could actually, yeah, by this by the actual skin color, I can I can tell that it's 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 getting treated. Um, a lot a lot harder skin, and you can see like this constrict, especially in this picture, it really constricts the chest and makes it really really hard to breathe. Um. But recent treat more recent treatments make it so that you know it's not kind of like a death sentence if your if your child is born with harlequin ichthyosis. Um, heavy amounts of retinoids, like topical retinoids, are used, um, and it's also um, oh oh oh. This reminded me that if you have this condition, like any any of the um, the ARCIs, then depending on what topicals you use you might be subject to being like poisoned or even intoxicated by them because the skin so readily like there's no barrier right it so readily takes in um ingredients that are in topicals but yeah das dat we want that enzyme we want those cross linkings we want them. It was really... I mean, my favorite part was learning about the different mutations. Those were really, really cool. So hash brown relatable. <laughs> oh yeah, I can't make Amy laugh or it will hurt. I'm okay. You're okay? I'm trying not to laugh too hard at your horrible jokes on the camera with the microphone. What? You were the one that said, oh, my cereal has corn You <laughs> said that. Not me. Not me. I don't know if the other one knows words. I don't know. If the other one knows words. I don't know. I try not to remember. <laughs> I try not to remember all the horrible <laughs> things that you say to me. But yeah. Um, also, guys, I have this wheel. I have this wheel where I can pick a uh, motherfucking the next subject that I talk about. The lecture is definitely not going to be until after the holidays, but I can still pick it, you know, like, uh, I can still pick it. I will, for the next couple minutes, uh, take recommendations for me to add to this wheel. <laughs> wow. Hi, Mom. That's my mom. Your mom's here? And, and you might think I'm joking, but I know I'm not. <laughs> That's your mom. That's my mom. Oh, they did an article on him. Okay, that's cool. Let me see. Oh, he looks good. Look at that guy. That's a friend. You can only see it in a little circle. I know. <laughs> that's all you get is the little circle. <laughs> Thank you. I made it myself. I made this wheel myself. Um, and like I said, I'll put more on it, but these are the ones that I have right now. We have apoptosis, programmed cell death. We have the mitochondria, crowd favorite. We have THC, crowd favorite. <laughs> we have G-protein coupled receptors, my favorite. We have, uh, clown hormones, which, Amy, can you tell us what clown hormones are? Oh, uh, uh, the gestrogen and the progesterone. I'll do it for the joke, though. I'll do it. 
Honestly, this is the mystery to everyone, though. No one knows about the menstrual cycle. And and here, you know what? Here's a promise. I'll talk about clown hormones when I talk about the menstrual cycle. How about that? Is that a deal? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I promise. I promise to do it. Check. The deal is struck. <laughs> <laughs> the deal's Hail done. Satan! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. It's better than clowns. It is better than clowns. Clown hormones are scary. Some people have phobias of clown hormones. Clown hormones. Alright. Well, hell yeah. Thanks for hanging. Well, I talked about keratinocytes. And also, thanks for letting me explain why these are terrible models. <laughs> and making me learn that Alpha Fold is deep mind. I still... I feel like I must have known that. I must have known that out the Alpha Fold was, was Google this whole time, but I really didn't. <laughs> Hell yeah. Alright, friends. It's peace out time. The next lecture will not be until after the holiday holidays, but I eagerly await. Deuces.